Okay, so we're back. The only thing that changed is that I am cooking. Whew! I decided on a... I had some decisions to make uh, as to how I'm going to proceed so that I'm doing something semi-constructive instead of just wrecking a, you know, $300 barrel. In this case, a $600 barrel blank. This one's no longer a blank. I took a gun that... Uh, was born as a 243 Ackley many, many years ago. I don't have a round count on it. I didn't even stick a bore scope in it because I'm making a fire form barrel. So to do that, I had to choose an action. I had to choose a method. I would like my fire form barrels to be adjustable for a variety of reasons. So I'm going to nut this thing so that I can subtly play with the head space. It started because I put fire form rounds in so tight that it's hard to get the gun closed and they fall out so loose that I'm not really super happy with them on the next firing. So if I set the headspace a half a thou long on my fire form barrel, then the brass goes back in and I can fire form load brass and take it to a match the next day um, knowing that even though it falls in just a wee, I can feel it closing down unless I need the speed and I can always size that speed back into it at a later date but for right now I prefer to have something a little bit of feel just reassures me that everything's cool I didn't get the wrong ammunition I didn't uh, do something else stupid because I do some really stupid stuff so we're back out here I may have to strip some clothes off because now all of a sudden even though I'm out here in the cold shop the heater's been running for a while all my tolerances are changed I say that as though it's a joke the, the joke part is tolerance. Um, metal is like rubber. I'll tell you a little story. I'm a concrete guy. When I started, I thought I was a gunsmith because I listened to my guidance counselor, but unfortunately they kicked me out of that program. So I immediately the next day went to work as a gunsmith, and that's all I did for a few years. Um, but the good Lord was looking out for me and he burnt our store down and I had to move because I had no money. I'm a kid. I don't I don't know money from my butt. You know, I'm managing the store, I'm doing all this stuff, I'm seeing what money does, but I'm wondering how people can actually afford to do cool stuff out there in the world. I had no idea how. So doesn't matter how it happened, but I was away at a gun show with our few wares and uh, the shop burnt to the ground. We lost all the stuff we had stored in the shop, a bunch of different, this isn't some kind of a sob story, this is just to illustrate, this gave me the impetus to pack everything I had into a little pickup trick and head to the East Coast and go to work in concrete. So I'm out here working Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, mainly Mass, and mainly Mass, I guess, mainly Boston area. And I'm an inquisitive guy. Uh, which means everybody hates me. I had people come up, people that I know to this day walk up and say, oh, how do you live with yourself every day knowing you're the stupidest guy on the job site? How do you live with yourself for asking these stupid questions? How do you sleep at night when you're so dumb, so ignorant, so... So what? It doesn't bother me. Um, so anyway, I asked a question. We're working on a parking deck up in Vermont, and there's sections of this that are five, six feet deep. It's got rebar. It's going every direction. There's rebar and concrete going all over the place. Now, because I had come through gunsmithing school and made it part way through and even close to the end before they kicked me out, I knew I'd done a lot of gas welding. Not a lot, but I considered myself to be a good gas welder. I played with TIG welding, of course, around you know where I grew up. Neighbors had TIG, they're fixing tractors, whatever, farm boy stuff. Um, so I knew what metal did when you heated it and cooled it. And I'm looking at this parking deck and I'm going, from night to day in Vermont, it's not uncommon to get a temperature differential of, let's just say, 50 degrees. There's 200 feet of steel right there. When it changes 50 degrees, it's going to grow two inches, three inches. I'm just throwing numbers at it. It's going to grow big. 
how come it doesn't just pop right out of the concrete? And that question wasn't answered for me for many, many years. It was just one of those stupid questions that Al asked because he's so dumb. He asks all these irrelevant questions. Well, years later, by the time I had uh, bought the company that I worked for and was now the owner, and now I could deal directly with engineers, uh, I was probably on my fifth one before I found one that answered the question because um, you know, engineers are no different than the rest of us. So anyway, one of them finally, I found an engineer who was actually interested in his job, and he said, hmm, it must be because their expansion coefficients are the same or similar. Those are almost his exact words, and I give you his name simply because he stated it so well that I was impressed. I used him for years after that until we elected a retard and the economy went in the toilet and we can go, you know, the, 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 the construction industry has gone through some evolutions in the last few years. And he ended up moving into Afghanistan and working on a government contract and, you know, he took his engineering skills elsewhere because he had skills to sell because the building trades were dead. But the, 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 the takeaway from this is that I knew to a point what Steele did, but he we talked a couple times after that, and he showed me the, ex the linear expansion coefficients of concrete versus rebar. Why concrete in rebar, why, how reinforced concrete works, because they expand and contract at the same rate, essentially. Just like uh, MOA, one MOA is an inch at 100 yards, essentially. <laughs> Deal with it. You know, it's no, it's not exact, but all the way out to 800 before you're going to ever see any difference. Um, that's an oversimplification. And I realize we're dealing with extreme accuracy. So let me, let me, let me not muddy the waters here. What I'm saying is this piece of equipment's moving all the time. I'm out here in this unconditioned shop, and it's the slab beneath me is moving the air around. I've got heat running on it right now, and this is this is where it gets really fun because I walk into here. It's winter in Washington, and we have had an unseasonably bitter, gross winter. Not as cold as some, but it's just gross outside. So the temperature in here hovers at around 45 degrees. That's not comfortable for work, and hence the dress. So then I thought I got a heater down there on that side and a heater over here on this side and they're pumping right at the corners of this lathe. So here I got this 40 degree hunk of iron and I've had heat running on two corners of it for, I don't know, an hour while I come down here to do this. But in the AA class, as I hear it, they teach that recognition of the problem is nine tenths of the cure. I happen to agree with that. If that's what they teach at AA, then good for them because that's the case. I can do just fine work because I recognize the problem. So, we're back again, and I have decided, probably against my better judgment, that I am feeling cocky today. I'm going to go ahead and try to dial my lead in way out here. I don't have any editing software, but if I spend an hour doing this and I bust it up beyond all redemption, I can always shut the camera off and do it again. <laughs> so that is my risk. I am going to go ahead and Gordy this pig in with my pivot, my mental pivot point at a different place than the actual pivot point in the jaws. And hopefully one of these days I can show you the original video I did of this and I can show you that it's quick. I set it up three times. Um, and did a whole bunch of other work within 40 minutes. I set it up twice because I ran out of filming time and once because I inadvertently loosened my outboards. I didn't. I forgot to tighten my outboard screws. So I bounced around, I moved the barrel, but all of this occurred in a fairly... This might take a while. Uh, you might have to go away. Go watch a movie or something while this plays because uh, even though I'm in 20 minute segments, this might take a few 20 minute segments. So, for right now, we start by setting it up between centers. I'll shut up now and uh, move forward. 
Now this is not the setting up of it between the centers right now. This is to get it kind of semi-close. This is to get it somewhere useful. I should, for those of you that might be interested, I guess I should, I can set this dial where we can read it a little bit. That's not perfect, but I think I got, yeah, I have clearance. That re yeah, look at that, look at that. So, to the left, I loose. To the right, I tighten. This has nothing to do with those silly little nursery rhymes for you people that can't figure out how threads work. The incline ramp of the threads runs clockwise by the world standard, all right? It isn't righty, righty, tidy, lefty, loosey. But in this case, lefty is loosey, so I'd be loosey. I'd be tidy. And I guess if you're the kind of a person that has the bottom of your shoes marked for footage, maybe you want to do this as lefty, loosey, righty, tidy. I got no problem with that. I don't care how it gets done. As long as it gets done. Okay, so I just over tightened that one because I felt it was springy. I went through this in the last video. Until these have been seasoned a time or two, they are copper or brass or whatever they are. We call it copper pipe or copper line. Um, depending on what part of the country you're from. If you're from corn country, you probably call it tubing. If you're from that part of the country that uses corn differently, you might well call it lime. But in any case, it is a coppery type substance and it has a little bit of life in it. And until it's deaded down good, it's kind of a pain to do what I'm doing. I hate to do it with new ones, but I wanted to just so that I could show the two or three of you that are interested in what I use and why, what I use. And the why part, I guess you'll have to figure out on your own, um, mainly because I love this stuff. So now I'm loosening it back up. I've loosened it up now to where it's running within a couple of thou between centers here. What did I just say? Sometimes I just revolt myself. Right now the outside of this barrel is running within a couple of thousands of, of on. That's all I'm trying to say. And now why? And, and we are going to, in the end, set both ends up on. But we're going to do it inside the board. We're not going to do it out here. So this is really, all I'm doing now is leaving it loose enough that I can go swivel the other end in. So now I've got this within a thou or two, and that accomplishes a few things. Once I get a dial that will be close enough that I can run a Gordy rod in or I could go in there with some indicators, there's a, a number of things I can do. We're going to check all that stuff out. But for right now, I'm going to whip this camera around. No, I'm not either. Okay, I'm going to shut this camera off and I'm going to get some cord because I didn't prepare myself well. And we're going to go around I'm going to show you what I do in the outboard stuff. Why not? It's going to be in segments, but as I said before, this thing started because somebody on the inner tube told me I was fooling myself and I, I used that as an excuse to start putting this stuff together and I really tried, I was actually pretty well planned out and set up on the last one, I got a lot done in 20 minutes. I was bustling around like a rat and uh, I pretty much succeeded in doing it un, uninterrupted. But I also had cords, the cords laying right over there, and I had this thing set up so I could trolley back and forth. Okay, here's this, here's this. I forgot today. Just brought the camera out. I didn't forget. I got distracted. I had to go in the other room. First I had to decide what I was going to do here. Then I had to decide that I'm going to use the bad action. Then I went back in the other room and said, okay, this is why I'm doing this. You know, This is why I find this to be kind of important. I really want this nutting thing to work. And there are people making it work. Um, there's a guy with an underground range that is a renowned shooter who made a comment on the internet that uh, nutting barrels can produce, can do good things for accuracy. Now, whether he was just shading all of us 
maybe a little gaming going on. He's not that kind of a guy. He has done so much for this industry that uh, someday I might be tempted to share his name if he doesn't feel disgraced by being associated because the man that I'm talking about is somebody that I not only trust implicitly but that I admire because of all the work he's done in the bench rest community. So thereby, I, he, I don't think it's a game. I think he honestly has situations where um, under controlled conditions he's getting good results out of a nutted PPC. I'm trying to get good results out of a nutted. Now I have nutted fire form setups all the way up to 375. A blown out 375 that starts as a Weatherby case. Uh, I've got a case called the 338 McCallum which is a blown out built a ton of guns on these, developed it for a guy named McCallum who came by one day and said, uh, I heard that you build guns. And I said, who did you hear from? And I don't like to be very noisy about it, but I am an old seven uh, manufacturer and I built some. He said, well, I spent over a hundred thousand dollars. I hunt all over the world and I've spent over a hundred thousand dollars on my shooting, my guns and ammunition and stuff. And I have yet to buy anything that does what it's purported to do. I hunt in some spots where there are elk at eight, nine hundred, a thousand yards, twelve hundred even on hill, in, in camp all the time. Been there for years, they're legendary. They know they're safe. They're in an inaccessible area that uh, Long story short is, is it possible to ethically take an elk at a thousand yards? And I very carefully and circumspectly said, well, I can't say no, because there are people that can ethically engage an elk at a thousand yards with the right equipment, but it takes years of, part of it's the money, but part of it is the years of uh, not practice. It's practice. We said, well, I've got you know, big lease up in the northern part of the state, thousands of acres, and we can drive and shoot in unknown ranges. And said, well, how, how passionate are you about this? So we designed this, this big case, and it has all kinds of weird fire forming properties. And I have to sell ammunition for it because I sell a whole package with the ammunition made, tuned, and fitted per package. So I had to come up with a fire forming procedure that was repeatable and solid and lots of brass. When I say lots of brass, I don't mean a whole bunch of brass. I mean different case lot, different lots. Um, even Lapua, who makes arguably the best brass on the planet, varies by year, varies by date, varies by lot, varies by availability. I don't, I don't know what, but they vary. So I have been using nutted barrels for fire forming for a number of years and now as I just showed you when we went in the other room and uh, pulled that barrel off you can see why I really man if I can make this thing work for the big picture for the long term it has some really solid serious advantages so I am going to get a cord on this thing so I can move it out of the way incidentally that'll give me better access to my tooling my uh, dial indicators in behind us here too which is going to be a side benefit. I had all this planned out the last time, and maybe someday if I edit that video in, we'll get it. But for now, we're doing this one all over again.